I give you John Rogers. All right, thank you very much. It's kind of uh, refreshing to come and give a talk at a place and be introduced by someone who doesn't really know you that well. So I'm going to benefit from that a little bit. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed my day. I know a lot of folks here and uh, uh, well aware of the very exciting research programs that are going on. Um, I'll tell you about some things that we've been thinking about and working on at Illinois uh, for the last uh, few years. And uh, I tried to put together a set of slides that might be appealing to a little bit you know, diverser audience than I'm usually um, used to speaking to. So there's not a huge amount of technical depth, but I hope to you know, convince you that you know, maybe some new ideas in electronics offer you know, new opportunities that could be uh, valuable you know, to, to society. And so um, we've been working on two things. And, and the title sort of conflates them both into one, but they're actually two very distinct fields of electronics that we've been thinking about. One uh, I'll refer to as bio-integrated, uh, and the second one uh, we are referring to as transient. And so uh, throughout the talk, I'll try to give you a sense of what these kinds of technologies are all about, what are the key issues in foundational material science you have to grapple with, and also give you a sense of the applications where you know, successful scientific efforts terminate in engineering outcomes that can be useful, potentially, in a broad sense to society. So what I'm going to do is start by telling you something you already know, which is that the uh, area of electronics and electronic technologies have been characterized by dramatic change uh, over the last few decades. And if you're getting a little bit older, like I am, uh, you've seen it and you've experienced it. And uh, you know, it's kind of represented by this sequence of, uh, of images. You know, it wasn't too long ago that uh, the only type of computers you could find are those that would fill a room or a huge uh, real estate space on your uh, desktop. But over time, what has happened is that the individual uh, devices in these uh, systems have uh, shrunk uh, enormously due to Moore's law scaling. What that means is you can make transistors exceptionally small that switch at very high speeds and can be integrated into very complex systems with much smaller footprints. And so you go from this uh, to this. And that is a profound uh, technical change, miniaturization, expansion, and function. But maybe what is even more remarkable is the qualitative impact it's had on the way that we use electronics, starting in the old days from very specialized purposes in industrial computation, academic research, to something that really permeates all aspects of our lives. So not just computation, but communication, entertainment, productivity, enhancement, and so on. And so if that's the past, this is the current, what is the future? Well, the dominant future is set by the semiconductor industry's roadmap, and it involves simply a linear uh, extrapolation of the trends that took us from here to here out into the future. So more and more size reduction, larger and larger numbers of transistors, higher and higher speed operation. I'd say 95% of the folks who think about the future of electronics, at least from the research standpoint, kind of grappling with some set of problems related to that scaling pathway. And that is a very interesting direction for research. It services a trillion dollar industry, so there's every reason uh, that people should be interested in that trajectory. Uh, but it's not the one that we've been thinking about. Uh, we and others are asking the question if there's you know, a different uh, future for electronics that is not simply a continued reduction in critical uh, feature sizes, but a future that addresses something that hasn't changed at all uh, in commercial integrated circuits from their very earliest days to their most modern uh, implementation. And that is that they always occur in formats built on rigid plates of silicon. So semiconductor wafers, that's fine. It works great. It's, a, it's an amazing class of material. You can grow it at commodity cost with exceptionally high priorities, very good charge transport characteristics, good thermal characteristics. There are a lot of reasons why. People have stuck with silicon wafers uh, over the years. But you can imagine that there are certain constraints. So you know, if you think about your uh, iPhone, this is one of the uh, you know, coolest piece of consumer electronics that I've ever owned. You know, what if you wanted to take the iPhone in this format is great, but what if I wanted to put this on my brain? Or what if I wanted to wrap it around my heart? Or what if I wanted to put it on my skin and have it melt directly into my epidermis to form sort of an intimate interface between this very sophisticated man-made technology and my body? for advanced clinical, therapeutic, diagnostic, wellness monitoring purposes. 
Well, it can't do that uh, because the silicon wafer itself has physical properties that are intrinsically and highly mismatched from those of biology. Silicon wafer is flat and rigid and planar and brittle. Biology is soft, elastic, and curvilinear. So if you could address that problem, uh, maybe you could open up new opportunities for applications of electronics that don't involve simply reducing the feature sizes and increasing the speed. So imagine electronics can kind of wrap the brain, integrate intimately with the skin, completely envelop the outside of the uh, cardiac surface to form almost like an ep uh, artificial epicardium uh, to do interesting new things in healthcare and shift the kind of mode of use of electronics from this to this to uh, this kind of, uh, kind of mode. So that's what we've been thinking about uh, uh, various other folks uh, as well. Let me just uh, you know, highlight that challenge uh, a little bit more explicitly in the context of neuroscience and study of the brain or clinical interventions on the brain. The brain is an electrical system and so if you wanted to study it, uh, probably the most ideal situation would be to bring to bear that problem those sophisticated electrical system uh, that is known to man, which is the silicon CMOS uh, integrated circuit. But uh, you know that integration doesn't work for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, the geometries are totally mismatched, but also the mechanical properties are totally different. So silicon has a modulus of 150 gigapascals. Uh, the brain tissue has a modulus of about five kilopascals. Moreover, the brain is time dynamic. It's swelling, it's contracting, it's rattling around in the head. And so how to integrate electronics with that kind of system becomes uh, you know, a question of practical importance in clinical medicine. How is it done today? This is uh, a Utah array. This has been the workhorse for uh, neuroscience for the last 15, 20 years. Extremely important piece of technology historically, will be in the future also. It solves the geometry mismatch through a, an array of penetrating pins, micro-machined in silicon terminating in a flat platform so you can dice the chip off of that wafer, glue it up here, form via connections to these uh, electrodes, and then with an air hammer uh, mounted into the surface uh, of the brain. It's great because these different pins can penetrate to different degrees in the brain uh, and thereby accommodating the shape uh, mismatch. Of course, when you do that, uh, you damage the brain, not only during the insertion, but it's worse than that because now you have a needle in a bowl of jello that's moving around. And so you have an interface that is con uh, continually degraded by that uh, mechanical uh, mismatch and uh, the time dynamic properties of the brain. So this is great. I don't want to denigrate it. Super important historically. will still be used in the future. But what one might ideally like to do is instead of this, reformat, figure out how to make that circuit look like that. So construct it in a way that offers soft, elastic mechanics matched to the brain in a shape conformal uh, manner and out of biocompatible materials. And so that becomes the problem statement. You know, if you're a material scientist like myself, you kind of map that challenge into a uh, materials problem. What are you going to use to uh, build a circuit that has those kind of characteristics? And you can think about different options. So we have historically worked on uh, organics. We think those are very uh, attractive classes of materials for unusual electronics. Tobin and a variety of other groups here have done outstanding work uh, in that area. You might also expand the palette out into inorganics, just for sake of completeness, and use as a comparison metric the field effect mobility, telling you how much current you can get out of a transistor, how quickly it can switch for given geometries. So if you think about it in those terms, the uh, polymers and small molecules that are available today, organic semiconductors are comparable to amorphous silicon. So you can do interesting things in display. This was a product of a team effort that we had back at uh, Bell Labs, a flexible paper-like display. You could probably do liquid crystal, maybe OLEDs uh, as well. That's interesting. But if you wanted to do a microprocessor, you're several order ma orders of magnitude short in uh, mobility. So for certain applications, it's great. Uh, but it can't take you up uh, a level of sophistication that you might be interested in. Unless, of course, you want to talk about carbon nanotubes and graphene as organic uh, systems, and I'm fine with doing that. We have been interested in carbon nanotubes and effective thin film material for electronics for a number of years. Uh, Mark Hersham has done some fantastic stuff, uh, IBM uh, as well. We continue to be interested in that class of material. But what I want to tell you about today is coming back to revisit silicon and ask the question, does it really have to be in the format of, of a wafer? And can you, uh, you know, deploy it in alternative uh, geometries to afford the kind of mechanics that you want 
uh, to enable this type of integration with the idea that if you can do it with silicon, you are building on a known technology base and uh, that can accelerate the maturation and uh, you know, emergence into re commercially relevant forms. So if you think about a silicon wafer, it does have the properties that I mentioned before. It's a plate of glass, essentially. You can't bend it. You drop it. It shatters into a million pieces. That's partly because of the intrinsic properties of the silicon, but it's also partly a consequence of the geometry of the wafer. It's about a millimeter thick. So if you imagine silicon now shaved down into much thinner geometry, so silicon nanomembranes. So think of a sheet of silicon. This is monocrystalline semiconductor grade uh, silicon at about 20 nanometer thickness. Um, that's interesting for a number of reasons that tie back to very elementary uh, considerations in mechanics. So it's really mechanical engineering. The first one of which is that the bending stiffness, the resistance to bending of a sheet of material like that is proportional to the product of the Young's modules of the material. We're sort of stuck with that with silicon, 150 gigapascals, but it scales like the cube of the thickness. And so as a result, if you plot bending stiffness as a function of thickness, it's just Newtonian mechanics. It takes you from a bending stiffness at a wafer format of about 10 Newton meters down to about 10 femtonewton uh, meters in this nanomembrane form. So that's just classical scaling, uh, pretty elementary aspect in bending mechanics. But whenever you change something by 15 orders of magnitude, that really has a qualitative effect on the way that you think about that material. So it comes goes from being a rigid plate of glass to a floppy noodle. And you can kind of see that uh, here. Uh, very, very flexible, very low bending stiffness in that sense. The other consequence of scaling thickness down is that for a given bend radius, R, the peak strain associated with bending is going down linearly with thickness. So it's not only floppy, but it becomes very bendable as you drive the thickness down. So those are two good aspects, uh, appealing aspects of making silicon very, very thin. Of course, this is not, however, a realistic platform for device technology because it's still fragile. I mean, that's just not a sensible substrate for uh, an integrated circuit. Uh, so you really have to think about using that material as a building block and then you know, uh, building up your integrated circuit on a sheet of plastic or a sheet of rubber to provide the kind of physical toughness that you want without sacrificing the mechanics that you're interested in. So that becomes then a problem in heterogeneous materials integration. So how do I take that silicon and put it on silicone, for example. And if you think about the challenges of doing that at a wafer scale, extremely daunting, because you have huge differences in thermal expansion coefficients of silicone rubber and silicon wafer. So it's very difficult to take a wafer and glue it to a piece of rubber and make a realistic technology in that way, because the mechanics are such that the interface stresses are enormous due to temperature changes. In fact, the energy release rate, which defines the propensity for a crack to form in a heterogeneous integrated system like that, scales with the square of the difference in the coefficients of thermal expansion times the square in the change of temperature. But this is an interesting scaling. It's linear in the thickness. So that means not only making the silicon thin has these appealing attributes in intrinsic mechanics, but it makes it much easier to do heterogeneous integration because this energy release rate is scaling down linearly with thickness. So again, you go from a wafer scale system, very, very difficult to maintain adhesion to a nanomembrane configuration with a stick without any adhesive at all. You can see that over here. This is a plate of silicon. It's sitting on in a cantilever geometry on a micro-machined ridge on a plastic substrate. No adhesive at all right there. Just Van der Waals forces can keep it uh, suspended in that way, partly due to this linear downscaling of the energy uh, release rate. So uh, that's why we like uh, silicon uh, nanomembranes as a building block. Now, there's a lot of uh, material science questions around how do you create silicon in that format? And how do you manufacture with it? I'm not going to go through those aspects and get a little bit too detailed for this talk, but just make the point that although this kind of mechanics is appealing, it's still not really what you want for biointegration. This is just bending. So you have a sheet of plastic, you can wrap a cylinder or a cone, but you can't even wrap a sphere, much less a beating heart. So what you need is not only bending, but stretching in the sense of elastic response to large strain deformation. And there's no limit in thickness that will get you into a stretchy form of silicon just by making it thinner. It gets uh, much more bendable, but still not stretchy. So how do you use stretchy? That turns out to be pretty easy, too. Uh, if you take this very thin silicon, uh, you can start with a membrane, cut it into strips, and now bond it to a rubber substrate. Ultimately, you want an elastic circuit. You probably need to use an elastic substrate. We like silicone rubber for that because we have interface chemistries that will allow rigid uh, and robust bonding to oxide surfaces, such as native oxide on silicon. If you take those silicon ribbons now and you bond them not just to a piece of silicone rubber, but one that's pre-stretched, uh, then when you relax the pre-strain, it puts the silicon in a state of compressive stress, 
That silicon responds to those compressive stresses through a nonlinear buckling instability that creates this wavy uh, accordion in physics in this very hard, soft, integrated material system. You think about this as almost a composite. But the beauty of this kind of geometry is now the out-of-plane deformations can uh, accommodate large in-plane strains in a way that avoids fracture in the silicon itself. So if I take this thing and I stretch it out this way, the amplitudes go down, the wavelengths go up in a way that accommodates an end-to-end -end overall strain deformation without creating substantial strains in the silicon itself. And so conceptually, you can think about this as a silicon accordion bellows. It turns out the mechanics is a lot more subtle than that. This gives you a good qualitative intuition, but this is a very non-trivial mechanics problem, uh, it turns out. And uh, in addition, mechanics is absolutely essential to these kind of design strategies. So you need to know the mechanics at a very, very deep level. Luckily, we've had very good collaborations with Young Gong Huang in mechanical engineering uh, here over the years. And I'm not going into the details, we spent about a year trying to figure out the mechanics. We published a whole paper just on the mechanics of those ribbons in PNAS in 2007. So we know all of the details. And again, that's critically important for this kind of technology because mechanics design becomes almost as important as circuit design, being able to manage the stresses and strains to uh, afford the effective system level mechanics that you want when you're stuck with a brittle material like silicon. So that's the idea, uh, give you a sense of the mechanics. The point is that kind of concept scales nicely straight up to uh, the circuit level. So you can take not just ribbons of silicon, you make an ultra thin integrated circuit, bond it to a biaxially pre-strained piece of rubber, relax it, you get a much more complex distribution of buckling patterns, but one that can again accommodate large strain deformations in a way that avoids fracture in the uh, circuit materials themselves. So this is a picture of such a circuit that was taken by our Beckman in, uh, Imaging Technologies group uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's aesthetically nice because what they did is they took a glass pipette, punched it in the middle of the circuit to create this image, but it also kind of illustrates the physics. So if you look back here, you can see that wrinkle edge in this interconnect trace. These are CMOS ring oscillators. Here, this local deformation causes a tensile strain. Here, you can see the co uh, continuous curvilinear shape induced by that. You can also see that those wrinkles are pulled out. So this thing is in a straight uh, geometry at this point, flat. If you pushed a little bit harder, you might fracture that line. So there's a range of stretchability. You have to do engineering design up front to make sure the layouts are compatible with the strain range of the application that you're interested in. So this is a pretty basic implementation of foundational ideas that have all kinds of different engineering elaborations. And I'm not going to go through those. I've written many, many papers. You can basically make a silicon integrated circuit just with the ideas that I talked about so far that have the mechanical properties of a rubber band. There's really no range of stretching that you can't accommodate with smart mechanical engineering and, uh, and geometric design. So if you have a technology like this, what's it good for? And I tried to outline in the first slide what we think it might be good for, and that is integration uh, with the body. And you might think uh, you know, the skin might be a place uh, to uh, consider. And people have been thinking about you know, integrating devices on the skin for a very long time. Uh, you know, 50, 60 years, maybe uh, even more, depending on uh, how far uh, you want to go back. Uh, but the devices sort of look like this uh, for the most part. Basically wire uh, contacts uh, taped onto the skin, and those wires come to a separate box of electronics, maybe you put on a strap uh, on an arm uh, like that. And this is fine, that's what you'd find in a hospital, uh, and it can be useful. But if you want to talk about real world monitoring, continuous health and wa uh, wellness uh, assessment, this is no good because uh, this is irritating. It's like Chinese water torture. You've got this tape on your skin, and over time that begins to irritate. It's also very hard to maintain robust adhesion because the mechanics of the skin well mismatch from the mechanics of the tape. And then the other disadvantage is the number of uh, point contacts that you can accommodate is limited because you've got to deal with a wire every time you put a new contact. So you could do three, but doing 1,000 probably is not feasible. So you can get a little bit more sophisticated. You take that box, you can crack it open, you pop the chips out, you can glue those to a tape, and then you can tape that to your skin, uh, and that's another design architecture. A little bit more appealing, but still limited, primarily because the tape, as I'd mentioned before, just offers bending mechanics. It can't accommodate the natural motions uh, of the skin, so it's irritating and it's hard to maintain robust adhesion. So we started working maybe three and a half years ago on uh, some other approach to uh, integration with the skin. And we sort of thought about you know, what's out there today that goes on the skin and works well. And you know, uh, kids' temporary tattoo is a great thing. Uh, goes on your skin, it looks great. 
And then the best part about it is you don't even know it's there after it's on. Uh, it can accommodate the natural motions of the skin without any constraint at all. Uh, and the interface adhesion can be robust, even without very sophisticated adhesives, no straps or penetrating pins. So the question is, you know, could you make an integrated circuit that looks like that in terms of physical properties? So an integrated circuit that's ultra thin, as thin as you can go, maybe five microns was a design point that we were targeting, ultra light in an aerial mass loading sense, very, very low modulus, as low as you can possibly go. But keep in mind, you've got to accommodate silicon, 150 gigapascals, but maybe five kilopascals is sort of at, aspirational goal. Stretchable in this case, about 30%. You stretch the skin more than about 30%, it's ripping anyway. Uh, and so that's kind of the strain range that you're interested in. Air and water permeable, you need to accommodate transpiration, but you want to waterproof the active components of the circuit so you don't get unwanted shorting in the epidermis. So that's you know, kind of what you want to do. Now it turns out that you can basically do that. Uh, based on what I said before, just a few simple ideas, thin, out of plane buckling mechanics, implemented in the way that I showed you, but then with one or two additional elaborations on top of that, most prominently taking the integrated circuit, instead of having a sheet that's buckled in 2D, cut it into an open spider web mesh, consisting of these very narrow, thin, filamentary serpentines in this kind of layout, mount that whole thing on a very thin rubber substrate, low modulus, 50 uh, kilopascals, and do all of that with um, attention to the details of the mechanics. And so this is where modeling comes back in. And so this is 3D FEM analysis of a system like this. We use this as a design tool in collaboration with Yang Gong uh, Huang's group to configure this system so that it has a modulus, a mechanical modulus matched to the skin. And this is what happens if you do that. Here are stress strain curves measured in an integrated circuit with that type of configuration for the circuit itself, the finite element modeling results over here, and skin. This is actually pig skin. Uh, it's cl pretty close to human skin. It's about 160 kilopascal over a strain range up to about 20% tensile. It starts going non-linear and there's an irreversible behavior up, up here, but uh, linear up to about 20%. Here's what the circuits look like. Again, if you've done this carefully, you can match this slope over the entire strain range of relevance up to about 20%. So the effective module is a little bit different X and Y, but right in the range of skin and very well aligned with the uh, design tools that we're using to lay out the mechanics. So that's how you do it. Of course, these things are buckling out of the plane. They're also rotating in the plane. So there's a, a complex uh, you know, 3D distribution of displacements that's being managed in this way. But the beauty of that is it's really a foundational architecture then that can accommodate all different types of devices. Uh, you can put silicon in there, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, in some ways somewhat agnostic to the detailed mechanical modulus of the materials because you're really relying on bending mechanics, not direct tensile strain. So you can build transistors, source drain gate, the active region is at that uh, intersection point. This is a resistor, that's for an amplifier for measuring biopotential. I'll show you some results in a little bit. Uh, this is uh, with the encapsulating layers on. Transistor doesn't really care that it's in this funky geometry on this soft substrate. It looks, uh, in terms of its performance characteristics, pretty similar to a comparably designed device that we build on a silicon wafer. Uh, in our fabs at Illinois. You can also do sensors. There's a strain gauge based on a conductive uh, PDMS. You can even do uh, photo detectors, maybe even solar cells. There's a PN junction uh, diode built into that horseshoe segment of these uh, serpentine uh, structures. So I've mentioned qualitatively a couple of reasons why low modulus is interesting. And there's sort of uh, you know, an intuitive sense that it's matched to the skin. That's great. It's going to be mechanically invisible. Let me just say a couple more words about interface uh, strength because that tends to be a key attribute that is missing from conventional technologies. How do you get robust adhesion without irritation? So it turns out it's like more a mechanics problem than a material science problem. So just think about the, uh, this construct. You have a piece of electronics, modulus E, thickness H, sitting on a piece of skin, modulus 5 kilopascal, thickness of 1 millimeter. And then think about what happens when you bend or stretch the skin. So think about stretching uh, uh, first. So you can compute, Yung Gong computed, the shear stresses that form between the interface uh, of the silicon and the skin as a function of distance for different kinds of electronics and the peeling stress, both of these stresses being the uh, types of stresses that can drive delamination. So first thing you see is that the uh, stresses are peaked up at the edge of the system, which is what you would expect. And then you can uh, assess the differences between a conventional silicon wafer-based circuit, 100 gig gigapascals, 300 microns thick, Plastic, this is conventional flexible electronics, so it might be a piece of kapton, 5 gigapascal, 50 microns in thickness. And then skin-like, epidermal, 5 kilopascal, 5 microns. 
So the trend is sort of what you would expect. You have the largest shear stresses when you have silicon chip. You do a lot better with plastic. You go to skin like, it's even better. Likewise on peeling stresses. The interest is in the absolute mechanics. So think about the stress ratios for the case of a silicon chip compared to a plastic sheet for two scenarios, tension in the skin and bending of the skin. Turns out that a uh, silicon chip has higher stressors, uh, stresses than a uh, plastic sheet, but not by that much, about a factor of five uh, for all of those uh, scenarios. By contrast, if you compare the same ratio, stresses associated with the interface between a silicon chip and skin and that between this uh, skin-like uh, epidermal electronics and skin, you're talking about a reduction in five orders of magnitude. And that has a qualitative uh, impact on the way that you think about design of skin adhesives to keep the electronics well bonded to the epidermis. And in fact, you don't need adhesives at all. So if you take one of these circuits, you put it on the skin of your postdoc who's done the work, uh, and then you come in uh, with a glass rod, you poke them a little bit, what you see is a response that's very similar uh, qualitative to that electronic tattoo. It's very thin. Just uh, Van der Waals forces are now sufficient to keep this thing adhered because of that very, very low interface stress that falls from the low modulus of the integrated circuit. Now, the absolute value of the adhesion is not that high. I grab it by the edge and I can peel it off. And this is what it looks like uh, when I take it off of the skin. Very floppy thing. It's not even self-supporting. It collapses down onto itself into that kind of glob. And so you might wonder how in the world do you manipulate these things to get them on the skin in the first place? And for a solution to that, we just go back to the world of temporary transfer tattoos, which in many cases involve a water-soluble uh, backing tape. So we can use PVA, for example, temporary handle for the epidermal electronics laminated on the skin, wash the PVA away, uh, and you're good to go. So that gets the electronics on, onto your skin. Uh, you don't have to directly manipulate. That's what it uh, is. Uh, what is it good for? So you might imagine you know, putting your iPhone on your skin or something like that. Maybe not that interesting, but if you're sitting on the skin, it's a great interface to the body. So you can do all kinds of uh, monitoring of body processes in that way. You can measure temperature with incredible resolution. You measure hydration state. You can also do electrophysiological measurements. So you put these on the chest. You can measure ECG uh, with good signal fidelity. Uh, you can put it on uh, regions where there are skeletal muscles. This is on the leg. You can do it on the forearm. And you can measure electrical activity associated with contraction uh, of the muscle. So here's a measurement of gait. So this is mounted on the leg, you're walking and then standing. Here's a comparison with the conventional uh, paste-on electrodes with a conductive gel to reduce the contact impedance. And what you see is the amplitudes of the signals are about the same. So we're not saying this technology offers better fidelity in measurement, at least as it's currently implemented. But there's a completely different uh, mechanics and a completely different level of integration uh, that's possible in terms of number of probing or stimulation uh, points. You can put them on the head, you can measure EEG, and you see all the usual things in terms of uh, alpha rhythms. Uh, you can do Stroop tests. This is all uh, the kinds of signals you would expect to see in a high fidelity EEG uh, measurement. If you're doing brainwave monitoring, you might think about a brain machine interface. You can certainly uh, do that. We have collaborations with Beckman folks uh, to do that. But maybe something that's unique about these kind of devices is to put them on regions of the body where you really wouldn't want a wire and a piece of tape. So think about the throat. The throat has a lot of fine motor control associated with speech. And you can pick up that motor control via EMG signals measured by ep epidermal electronics on the throat. These are frequency spectrograms of throat EMG measured in that way as the subject is saying different words. So stop, go. This could be vocal or subvocal, And you see different patterns here. We work with a, a signal processing expert in ECE at Illinois. And he developed uh, pattern uh, recognition algorithms that would correlate this kind of data to a finite vocabulary of words. So you can develop a brain, uh, human machine interface based on neck EMG. So you might imagine you know, strategies for controlling a prosthetic. Somebody so suffers a disease from the trachea. Maybe this could be an interesting technology. A lot of those things uh, could be pursued. My students were a little bit more interested in seeing if you could play video games uh, with this thing. And you can do that. So this is an uh, epidermal uh, electronic controller via your neck. So we have that technology now. You want to play a video game with your neck, we know how to do it. Uh, you can move a cursor up, down, left, and right, just saying up, down, left, right. Turns out that this is a strategy game uh, by choice because at that time it was just the, uh, the pattern recognition was just implemented in uh, software. We've gotten a little bit better, uh, so we can go faster now and do maybe more uh, interesting types of control uh, systems. And this is a movie of bimanual control of a helicopter. 
So what you'll see is uh, this is my postdoc. That's really dark, actually. Uh, in the background, um, I don't know if you can see anything here, but anyway, he has uh, these epidermal electronic sheets on his forearm, and he can uh, execute different commands to a helicopter that's flying here. So he rotates his fist to make the helicopter launch. He tilts his fist to make the uh, helicopter rotate. Then he clenches his fist to make the helicopter fly. Uh, and so he's flown it over here. Oh, you can see this. He's landed it. He's launched it back up. And then he'll fly it back here. And what he's trying to do is get it to land uh, in that box. So he's rotating the helicopter. He'll stop, clench his fist, and the helicopter will now fly back in this direction. And he'll try to land it right there. And as he drops it, uh, he misses, so he needs, a little bit, <laughs> he needs a little bit more practice, but you get the uh, idea it's possible to do that. Um, so that's uh, video games, that's helicopters. There's a lot of applications in sports. We have a startup company uh, in place to commercialize this stuff. This is one of the first examples in an actual sporting event to the extent that you think of NASCAR as a sporting event. Uh, one of the devices right there, there's a prominent racer on the circuit. We had them uh, wired up in March and also most recently in November. This device measures temperature, uh, EMG, and hydration uh, during the race. I'm not sure what that information is good for, but it's a good uh, demonstration of a real-world uh, use case. Uh, I think there are other more compelling applications in other areas of sports. And one cool thing about MC10 as a technology company, done a lot of technology companies in the past, you always have a technical advisory board. We have that with MC10, but we have something much cooler, which is a sports advisory board consisting of Grant Hill, Matt Hasselbeck, Matt Burke, uh, football, basketball, and then a lot of other sports I don't know that much about, but there's some uh, prominent folks uh, there. These guys are actually uh, extremely uh, enthusiastic uh, about this stuff, and so uh, I think I hit a milestone when I saw emails from Grant Hill uh, flying around. I didn't think that it would ever happen. Uh, to me. Matt Hasselbeck is one of the most uh, enthusiastic guys about this technology. We launched product in, uh, at CES two weeks ago, and he was the main uh, spokesman. He has a small equity piece uh, in the company. And the product is an impact monitor, three-axis accelerometer, and a gyro in uh, the flexible headband of a soft good made by Reebok. So this is a joint MC10 uh, Reebok product, and it's designed to address problems in concussions that are occurring uh, in football, uh, and you can see them there. But this is what's cool. Look at that. That's my device right here. I only published this a year and a half ago. That's on the throwing arm of a Pro Bowl quarterback, starting quarterback for the uh, Tennessee Titans, which is, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but football is maybe not a compelling motivation for a research program. Uh, maybe it is. But we think that this is a better one. So I mentioned before that these paste-on electrodes are kind of a hassle uh, you know, for adults, for premature babies, that's a disaster. And you need to do sophisticated monitoring uh, on uh, humans at this uh, age uh, because they're very fragile. So this is what it looks like today. What we hope is that we can make systems that look like that. And this is into the future. It's just Photoshopped. It's just to give you a sense of what we're <laughs> thinking about. We, did not put anything on a baby. <laughs> so we're not going there. Uh, but I think you know, some of the pieces are coming together to enable something like that, and that's what we think uh, a lot about. Let me mention one more thing, and then I'm going to shift uh, gears. And that comes back to this brain uh, application I mentioned at the outset. So we've been interested in that sort of skin-mounted heart and brain. Uh, in the case of brain, we work closely with uh, experts at the Penn Epilepsy Center, University of Pennsylvania's uh, medical school. And they deal a lot with the neuroscience and surgical, surgical intervention associated with epilepsy. And one of the procedures that they do, and we work closely with surgeons who do this, for uh, epileptic patients that are non-responsive to drug treatments, these are very acute cases, is they require surgical intervention that involves a diagnostic uh, step and then an interventional step. And the diagnostic step involves cutting the cap of the skull off, exposing the brain. This is just local anesthetic, so the uh, patient is awake. Uh, you laminate electrodes, just passive electrode pads, you a strip or a cap like this onto the surface of the brain, then you stimulate a seizure and you record uh, the electrical activity, each one of these points. You develop a spatiotemporal map, a trained surgeon can tell from that map which part of the brain is most uh, involved in the seizure. At that point, you strip this back, you go in and you cut out that part of the brain. So if you're going to do that, and that is what they do, um, what you would want is very, very high spatial and temporal resolution in this mapping. 
This architecture does not get you there because it requires a separate wire connection for every probing location. What you really need is embedded electronics for multiplexing the local amplification. If you could do that, then you could bootstrap off of Moore's law. Instead of doing you know, 30 points, you do 30,000, something like that. So that's what we have focused on. This is a system we built initially for cardiac and then modified for uh, neural. Uh, in this case, it's a few thousand of these nanomembrane tra uh, membrane transistors multiplexing, amplification, and then these pads that uh, contact the tissue. The whole thing goes on to the brain like a piece of saran wrap, uh, essentially, uh, and then it sits there for monitoring. So we've done uh, a lot of animal work on this kind of technology. They maintain a colony of epileptic cats at Penn, which is kind of a disturbing thought in itself, um, for these kind of experiments. So the cat's under local anesthetic, cut the brain, uh, skull off, you laminate this device, that's our device, onto the uh, brain of the cat, and then you uh, stimulate a seizure. And you can measure it, and measure it really at uh, fidelity and spatial resolution that's never been possible before. This is a movie uh, of that uh, data recorded in that way, drastically slowed down compared to real time. So the drug p uh, picotoxin is introduced here. That creates some very abnormal activity in the brain, but the cat is not undergoing a physical seizure yet. That doesn't happen until about a second and a half later. Associated with that spike, this is a single channel in that array, just representative one. This is time, one second, two, three, four. That corresponds to when the cat is now physically undergoing a seizure. You see a very time periodic response and the potential at that single channel, and that's reflected in this kind of recurring spiral wave instability uh, that you see in the spatiotemporal map. So that has never been uh, observed before, so I think it has value in understanding the basic neuroscience of epilepsy, but it also has this clinical utility uh, that I mentioned before, and that's driving a lot of our uh, choice of research uh, project is something that has clinical use, not just uh, research tools. So that represents an area of active uh, research uh, for us. And by now, you know, the technology has moved from material science journals to ones that are in areas of specialty that are addressed by the end uh, systems. And I think we've graduated up, uh, and that's good evidence of that. So with the last bit of time that I had, let me shift gears a little bit uh, by coming back to this slide, uh, which I used to sort of uh, pose the problem and set the landscape for this bio-integrated electronics, which is addressing uh, an intrinsic feature of every known commercial integrated circuit that's ever been built, which is this planar, brittle configuration, moving it into a soft, stretchy uh, regime. Now, if you think about some of these devices, the clinical, surgical tools, diagnostic systems, it's not necessary the device has long-lived biocompatible operation because it's only in contact with the tissue for a limited amount of time. That doesn't define the entire universe of opportunities, however, for this technology. You might imagine in this circumstance, in the future, maybe you have an artificial pericardium. It goes on your heart and it stays there for 10, 20 years. And it does monitoring, it does intervention, it prevents uh, you know, disease states, prevents uh, arrhythmias, for example. In that kind of configuration, you might want the device to last forever. And that's a daunting challenge, and it's one that we've been thinking about, and it's well aligned with the way that people have tried to in, uh, engineer integrated circuits in the past. That is, to make them last forever, uh, to the extent possible, based on materials uh, selections. And it's really one appeal of solid state electronics. There's no moving parts, you have the potential to do that. Having said that, if you think about devices of this type, there may be application scenarios where you do not want them to live forever. In fact, you want them to go away at program times. And that's completely different from the engineering design goals that have uh, served as a foundation for electronics development over the years. So think about an integrated circuit that's water soluble, for example. Disappears completely over time in an engineered and programmed way. Something that would uh, dissolve into a biologically or uh, environmentally benign form. That could be interesting as an alternative to open up other kinds of applications that are intrinsically poorly addressed by this kind of electronics that last forever. So that's something that we've been working on for the last two and a half years or so, published the first paper on it in uh, September. And we're referring to it as transient electronics because you don't have to think about it only as an implantable device that bioresorbs or something that goes into the environment and disappears, but more generally, thinking about time as a design variable in an electronic system. And so this is the definition, transient electronics, any system that dissolves, resorbs, or otherwise physically disappears at programmed rates or triggered times. And it's in that sense that they're temporarily transient. 
And you can imagine uh, applications uh, for that kind of technology. I already mentioned therapeutics that go inside the body, perform a function uh, for a well-defined period of time, and then dissolve to eliminate unnecessary device load. I'll give you a specific example of that uh, in a few slides. Environmental monitors, maybe you throw out into the field at the site of a spill uh, 100,000 monitors to help you remediate that spill, but you don't want to have to go back into the environment and clean them up. Uh, they would just simply disappear or to address the emerging uh, problems associated with uh, waste disposal in consumer electronics, devices that simply disappear. Most people don't want to keep their cell phone more than uh, two, three years anyway. You know, they basically just disappear uh, after that uh, period. So how do you do it? We uh, grappled with this for uh, a while before stumbling on the solution. You think about uh, material selection for electronics uh, and you add the additional design constraint that it's water soluble, then you might think you know, there, there's no way to do that. But it turns out that uh, silicon itself, in these very thin forms, dissolve at physiological pH and temperature uh, values. Because they're so thin, hydrolysis happens at rates that are relevant to the applications you might think about. And that was uh, a lucky coincidence. So if you take one of these silicon nanomembranes, this little platelet here, you immerse it in PVS uh, buffered to 7.4 pH, that's sort of physiological pH at 37 degrees. You can watch it disappear. And it disappears into reaction products of silicic acid, which is biocompatible. So there it goes. At about two weeks, uh, it's completely gone. And you can map the kinetics. We work with Young Gong. He does not only mechanics, but also reactive diffusion modeling to understand corrosion process, essentially, that's governing uh, this uh, disappearance. Um, but that's critical because uh, silicon then allows you to think about a lot of different uh, electronic components. But let me just highlight the importance of this nanomembrane geometry. So silicon at a thickness of 35 nanometers, we know how to do that pretty well. Dissolution time, physiological pH, and temperature, 10 days. Only requires 4 tenths of a millimeter for a chip that's a centimeter squared on a side. So very small uh, amount of water is required. You think about a silicon wafer based electronics, same size, thickness 700 microns, uh, it's nearly 1,000 years to dissolve. And by the way, it requires eight liters of water. So this is not something relevant for inserting inside your body if you want it to be uh, transient. But this, this does uh, uh, fall into that regime. So silicon, uh, you add to that a conductor. We like magnesium. Uh, magnesium oxide is a great interlayer dielectric. Uh, and then we like silk as a uh, material platform and an encapsulation layer. So there you have all the basic materials. I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, but those kind of get you started. And so you can build devices. That's a coal pits oscillator, uh, MOSFET over here, uh, RF diode, resistor, inductor, uh, capacitor. Uh, and the whole thing uh, dissolves completely at the molecular level in water. And you can kind of see it go here. If you take one of these devices, uh, you immerse it into a beaker of water, uh, you'll see it go. In this case, you can control the uh, beta sheet content of the silk to control its dissolution rate. In this case, uh, it's essentially amorphous, so it dissolves very quickly. When it dissolves, it causes the magnesium traces to fragment. They dissolve themselves to magnesium hydroxide uh, in a few hours, and you'll see that in time lapse. Uh, eventually, the magnesium is completely gone. The silicon is not. Uh, but you can't see it. Uh, it's much too thin and much too small to be visible at this scale, but it will uh, dissolve over a period of a couple of weeks. And so it's completely gone. So you can do a lot of things immediately. So here's uh, MOSFETs. There's uh, a, uh, an inverter. The characteristics are quite uh, nice, at least at these design rules. High mobility is high on off uh, ratio. You can do photo detectors. You can do uh, diodes for uh, multiplexers. You can even make uh, simple digital camera, or digital imaging chip. This is an array of photo diodes. That's a picture taken with that uh, type of uh, imaging sensor, the whole thing uh, water soluble. You can do uh, thermal uh, sensors. These are uh, RF, uh, sorry, uh, PN junction uh, diodes. You can do very high sensitivity temperature mapping. You can use uh, piezo resistive effects in uh, silicon to measure strain. So you can make sensitive uh, strain gauges. Um, but if you think about the underlying science, it's all about corrosion science. Like how do you control the dissolution rate of materials? How does morphology and chemistry control that? And uh, you know, that's really where our emphasis is now. This is PC PCVD oxide. This happens in a reactive diffusion model that involves water going into the film and then dissolving it from inside out. And these are the results of Young's models. Those are data 
And so we think we have a decent uh, handle on this. So I think there's a lot to do in the underlying material science. But in the meantime, we can sort of build things and think about application. So if you think about a transient electronic device, you might ask, it has a certain operational characteristic. You put it in biofluids, it starts, starts dissolving. Doesn't that change the operation instantly? You start uh, dissolving the materials. And that is true, but that's not the way you deploy these things. You deploy them with an encapsulation layer on top. The disappearance of that encapsulation layer then defines the functional lifetime. Once the encapsulation is gone, then the water starts to dissolve the actives themselves. That changes the operation. So by adding an encapsulation layer, controlling its thickness, its dissolution time, you can achieve two-stage kinetics, stable operation, uh, and then rapid uh, transients uh, immediately uh, after that. And that, that's a critical design aspect. So, let me give you one example of something that you can do with the device uh, technology as it exists now. So we've done a lot of animal tests. You can implant these subdermally, uh, subdermally in uh, mice. You go back after a couple of weeks and, and nothing is there. We don't see any inflammation. That is not establishing uh, in a full scale biocompatibility, but it's a proof of concept. So if you can't do that, what would you uh, want to implement in that way? And we think that there could be utility in treating surgical site infections, which is one of the leading causes for readmission into the hospital after a surgery, bacterial colonies that develop at the site of the surgery. A lot of those bacterial strains are antibiotic resistant these days. So if you can make a non-antibiotic thermal-based bacteria site that you could insert subdermally in the form of that kind of applique, then you can activate it from the outside, eliminate the bacteria by local heating, in this case using wireless uh, inductive uh, coupling, eliminate the bacteria. But in this case, you don't want the device to stick around for a long time because the period of highest risk is only about two weeks after the surgery is done. Beyond that period, the incidence for an infection are very, very low. So you design this device to last about two weeks. After that point, uh, it's gone, and it eliminates uh, then that unnecessary device load. You don't have to go back in and fish it out. So that, that's one example of uh, something we're thinking about. Let me uh, just show two more slides, and then I'll conclude. So if you think about the material constituents, magnesium, uh, silicon, uh, silk, uh, these are all materials that are found in your daily recommended diet. They have natural physiologically occurring concentrations that are actually much higher than the amount of materials that would go into a typical integrated circuit. And let me just make that point. So if you have a Cole Pitts oscillator like this, you sum up the total amount of magnesium you have. It's about 100 micrograms. In this case, about 3 micrograms of silicon. If you go to a single daily vitamin, you find that it has about 300 milligrams of uh, magnesium and about 10 milligrams of silicon. So about 3,000 times more of these elements in a weight sense compared to what's present in that integrated circuit. So it means that it's not only, you know, it's suggestive that it's not only implantable in a bio, uh, biocompatible way, uh, but it's also edible. Uh, potentially. Uh, it could be good for you, actually. There's some good vitamins in there. If you want to eat uh, a coal pits oscillator, uh, you can do that. And in fact, I have uh, a sample here. Um, if you want to come down, take a look at it, it's on uh, a silk film. And you might be anticipating a demo at this point. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have done that. Uh, not to say it would never happen, uh, because it did happen uh, at this IEDM keynote. <laughs> I gave in uh, December, and uh, it was a one-shot deal to win a bet with a DARPA program manager, and I decided it's in bad taste to do this over and over again. So uh, it's, a, it's a one and done, uh, but, it, but it, did, uh, it did happen. Anyway, you want to take a look at the circuit, be happy to do that. So let me uh, conclude then and uh, mention that we think uh, you know, there might be some interesting complementary opportunities in silicon uh, electronics that don't lie on the roadmap that most people think about. And one of them is all about biointegration. It's basically mechanical engineering here. Uh, and the other one is in transient electronics, and it's basically corrosion science is the key uh, frontier. Uh, but I think of it as all being material science, which is my home department. And so I think there are a lot of cool things to be done here. And we've just gotten started. I think there are a lot of opportunities for other folks to make contributions uh, as well. So with that, let me uh, just conclude by acknowledging a few senior collaborators, very interdisciplinary. We do a lot of stuff. Young Gong, Pierre, uh, Placid Ferrer does all the manufacturing systems. I mentioned Todd uh, Coleman. We try to work with clinicians whenever we can, uh, neurologists, cardiologists, interventional guys, to understand what the requirements are, uh, the guys at Tufts. And so I usually just uh, you know, list the senior collaborators here. 
Young Gong's name should probably appear like four or five times <laughs> in this list. Uh, we published over 100 papers with Young uh, over the years, and he's really been a fantastic uh, collaborator, probably the best ever uh, that, I've, that I've experienced. So let me uh, acknowledge him especially. But uh, really, hats off to the students and the postdocs who do all the work. Uh, I only talk about it. They do it. A lot of the ideas come from them. This is a group picture about this time last year. Mostly grad students and, and postdocs here. But these days we get huge involvement from undergraduates uh, as well, maybe between 30 and 50 in the group uh, at any time. And we have this undergraduate research symposium at the end of each semester. And they make enormous uh, contributions uh, as well. And so I'd like to thank them. Uh, and I thank you for your uh, attention. Be happy to answer questions if you have any. <laughs>